All, All right. right. Oh, okay, go, go ahead. Go ahead, oh, dude. Oh, Johnny. Oh, no, dude. If you want to jump in, it's fine. Welcome back, everybody, to Surviving Hollywood Podcast. My name's Austin. My name is Aaron. And I'm Johnny Ray Diaz. And we just had a great guest, character actor, musician, Tom Proctor. Super good dude. We met him at a film festival. Um, do you guys want to elaborate on how we originally got to know Tom? Yeah, so we met at the Chandler Film Festival, which uh, for our audience that has been listening, our film Papua actually screened there. Was it what, two years ago, maybe? Two, I, yeah. I don't remember how long ago it was. But anyway, we met Tom Proctor there who had a film called Legacy. And he was actually nominated for Best Actor and won. And uh, we had some great conversation with him down there. And our film Papua won Best Comedy. And now we're here, we, here we are back in LA and we reached out to him and he agreed to jump on and it was a awesome, awesome interview. What was your favorite, what was your favorite part guys? So Tom is a very successful, you'd consider him a character actor, plays like a, he looks like a grizzly cowboy and he is in a country rock band, which he is the leader of. Um, and he's been in all sorts of stuff like uh, Guardians of the Galaxy. Uh, Ballad of Buster Scruggs. Yeah. 12 Years a Slave. His part in Django Unchained got cut, or it's not as you wouldn't recognize him from that movie, but he's been in that. Um, and my favorite part was just how real Tom got with us. He's a grisly, salt of the earth guy. Um, you know, he's an artist, a Renaissance man, so he's acting, he's, he's touring with his band. Uh, my favorite part was when he was talking about his music um, and just, you know, playing his music for one certain acting project. And then I said, uh, Hey, I'd love, uh, could you play us that song right now? And he said, well, oh, yeah, I think I could. And he got out his guitar and he tuned it up and he played us a song and it was really good. It was a good song, right? Yeah. It was like, I was actually like, man, this, I could definitely see this in a movie. Like I was like, this is like a perfect movie cinematic song. You know what I mean? So it was really cool. Um, I, I really liked um, kind of him, you know, talking about, you know, when he was working on like the set with the Coen brothers, what that experience was like, how he didn't quite get the audition and he had to sort of fight for it, things like that. When you feel like a character actor as known as Tom Proctor should be in a movie like Ballad of Buster Scruggs and how he had to kind of like fight to sort of get on that movie. I like hearing stories like that because it's like even a guy that's been in so many different things, I mean, in a sense, he's still kind of like auditioning for certain projects, you know, and he just does it because he loves it, which is really cool. Yeah. Um, guys, let's roll the episode. If you're watching at home, feel free to give us five stars on iTunes, like the video, comment. It truly does help us out, helps with the algorithm. Uh, but roll it. Yeah, hey, Johnny Ray Diaz and the Arnold Twins. It's that Survivor Hollywood podcast. I'm a let's go. Hey. Hey, reactions, acting, lights, camera, action, interview with talent with an artistic passion. Surviving Hollywood, surviving Hollywood, surviving Hollywood. It's the podcast. How's it going? Good, good. How you doing? Great. Thank you for uh, for taking your time out of your day to uh, to jump on with us. No problem. No problem at all. Do you uh, remember us, Tom? Yeah. <laughs> Hell yeah. You guys won that. Uh, <laughs> Uh, comedy thing had that really good show at the Arizona yes. Film Festival, and you yes. won Best Actor slash Actress, and you had a really good film too. I, I think I got it for Best Actress because they saw <laughs> it the day before in a mini skirt. There you go. <laughs> I saw it too, and I was impressed. <laughs> yeah, I thought I thought that was weird that they only had one Best Actor award there because God, I saw a lot of people that. Was you it know. limited? Was it limited to just shorts? Because I don't remember. Was it? No, or was it all features and everything? And, yeah. and yet there was one, one category for best actor. Hmm. Yeah, and actress. It combined them both, and so that was they weird. Them. Yeah, and yeah, that doesn't that doesn't make a lot of sense. Yeah, it's weird. Well, and I seen some shows that had some dynamite actresses. That that uh, yeah, I thought. Because you watched every single short that weekend, correct? Or a lot of them. I watched every, almost every film. There were some late, some that came in late that I didn't see. 
because mm. Tom was the guest of honor at the uh, film festival, right. Chandler International Film Festival. He was the he was the big name. Had a you know this guy's uh, done a lot as we'll get into, but uh, it was also his job to watch him since he was also a judge. Yeah, I was gonna say because you were judging too, so that that makes yeah it makes sense why you'd have to watch all of them. Yeah. Um, kind of talking about that project, I know I, I remember having a conversation with you there, and. I remember you saying something you, one of the reasons you did it was because it's something different than you've done before. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I do. You know, I, I'm never the, the sentimental guy, you know, that's, and, and this was a, you know, based on, it was a true story about her dad, the girl's dad. And, um, and here's what was weird is we, because I was judging, we, you know, you have to nominate for different categories. We didn't even nominate me. Mm. So somebody else, one of the other judges then did? The other judges pulled that together is I see. what what happened there. Uh, behind your back, they did it without you knowing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They just said, no, this, this, is, this is what should happen. This, this is the guy. Well, 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 well deserved, good. well deserved, yeah. you know? That was, a, that was a cool, that was a really cool project. Um, how did you get involved? in that project specifically did they just reach out to you or the project is called legacy by the way it's a short right. film short film by mark and anna yeah mark and anna the, the director and that had done uh the graphics for another film that i did which i also won best actor in mm. and they had done the title graphics and all that stuff for it and um and which was weird that they wanted me to play it because in the other film the character is a serial killer who can't, you know, who basically openly admits that he, you know, he says it, in the script, he says, you know, I, I just can't help it. I love killing people. And, you know, I've tried to, to, to stop myself and, uh, you know, God knows they can't stop me. And, you know, and, you know, and he talks about how he even left the police hands and all oh, that, wow. and uh, they they couldn't figure it out. And so basically, what he's done in this other film called Sins is he kidnaps this mayor, and then shows him all the evidence that he left for his police department, and not only exposes himself but several other serial killers, because he's found God, and now he wants to he wants to. He wants the death penalty and he wants to, uh, you know, leave the earth with something good. It was, you know. Sort of like re redeem himself in a way. Yeah. 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 So I, I guess part of the reason, I guess the allure of that project was it was a completely different character, right? Yes. Completely uh, different, completely bizarre. I know you can't speak for everybody, but generally speaking, you've been in some of the most blockbuster top movies, Guardians of the Galaxy, 12 Years a Slave, Ballad of Buster Scruggs, etc. How easy is it to get sort of a named character actor like yourself, like other people, to look at, you know, your short film? You must get hit up a lot. Okay. This is the deal. And no one understands this. And uh, I, I do. I get hit a lot. And... A, an example is there's another film that a stunt buddy of mine hit me up about. Says Tom, I need you in my movie, and I cringed. Oh dear Lord, I should. Because he's a stunt man. Okay. But he's also my dear friend, and you know, so I like I'm like oh fuck, I don't really, I can't really say no. It's James Logan for Christ's sake, you know. I mean, I have thrown that man across the room more times. Then, <laughs> you know, it's like every time we're on the film set together, I says, so what wall am I throwing you through? What window am I throwing you yeah. through? Where am, I, where am I throwing you this time? <laughs> and, uh, um, but he asked me to do this, and I, I just thought, shit, I gotta do it. Because I, you get your, a good actor is an addict to the art. We're, we're drug addicts. And, you know, it, it's like if you've got that syringe and it's full of pure shit, 
or a line all out on a mirror and it looks nice and white, we're going to do it. <laughs> so our managers can tell us not to do it. Like my manager yeah. not to do many shorts. My agent can tell me not to do it. But there it is, that line all laid out across the mirror, the razor blade, you move it around. Next thing you know, bam, you're on that movie set. Yeah. And, um, you know, it, it, it's just project more than anything else. I've got another project that I'm, uh, they, you know, said, you want to do this, you want to not do this. And I thought, and, I said, why are you iffy on this one? It's a feature film. It's a good role. I said, well, it's, you know, modified low. So it's gonna, not mm -hmm. going to play you full scale. And, I, you know, I get better than scale on a lot of my shows. And um, so my whole thing was I read the script. And from that moment on, I just said, no, I'm doing this movie. I'm... Mm -hmm determined to do this movie you know first off it's a a movie that my grandkids will play that movie until their parents are sick of watching it wow you know it's and 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 i have very few things that i want my grandkids to watch yeah. you know then a lot of it is the people involved you know you got it you got a uh you got to, you know, just like having met you guys and everything like that, just in, in what I saw in that one time, if, uh, you know, if you sent me something and I didn't have time to read it, I would just go, okay, yeah, but, but I had the schedule open to do it. I would go, okay, yeah, we're going to do that. I'll read it later. Because I know it would be good. I know it would be working with good people. I know it would be fun as shit. And, and you know, so it's like, I get a free family reunion. I get to do something I love doing. And, you know, and that's what it all matters about. Even uh, Meryl Streep was at a thing for a graduating class of writers. And they said, what do we have to do to get, you know, what would we have to do to get you on, on our film? And she says, write it. Write a good challenging role. Write something really good you know so it's, I, so it's go ahead i get a lot of phone in roles that i can literally phone them in right and bad, uh, bad guy cowboy bad guy yeah as a matter of fact this film that just came out uh blue ridge i had come back out of new orleans on another film and i did a film for them before that a western called uh legend of five mile cave now here's another example of guys that do not high budget films, but good inspirational films. But they working with them, it's like family. They're 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 just awesome. And I just come off. I'd done my music video for my uh, Lost in New Orleans, and a horror film while I was in New Orleans. And I just got off the plane, and I'd been in a kind of a dead cell area down there in the bayou. And my phone blew up when I got off the plane. My agent, my manager says, hey, hey, these guys uh, that did uh, Legend of Five Mile Cave, they're doing another Western and they want to know if you want to be in it. And, and uh, I haven't had a chance to look at the script yet. And I says, of course I do. It's, I know who it is. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yes, say yes. She goes, well, you got to turn around and get back on a plane. Classic. And so I said, okay, yeah, say yes. I literally went through Walmart, bought a suitcase, a bunch, because all my clothes, I, you know, I'm not good at doing laundry at the hotels. Uh, and so I went through the, through the, through Walmart, bought a bunch of clothes and a suitcase and flipped around, got back on the plane. I always have my little travel guitar with me. Well, I'm on the plane read, and I, I get the script printed. I have somebody print the script for me, do a flip around. And I'm thinking, okay, it's a cowboy movie, you know? So I kill a few guys, beat up a woman and then get killed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All in a day's work. Y'all in a day's work. Yeah. Well, I get on the, the plane and I'm reading the script and it, the guy is a, a country singer in a bluegrass band and 
I'm listening to watch it, paying attention to the script. I go, oh, this one song that I've got would be perfect for this, this thing. And I had just got done doing shows down in New Orleans and everything like that. So, and, and I came right from having done a, uh, a, I don't know how I keep getting mixed in with these little blues tours because I'm definitely country rock and you, Tom Proctor band. If you look at that on uh, iTunes, you know, all those things is definitely country rock. And um, I, I, uh, I, so, I, so I literally came off the plane, got back on the plane. So when I walked, got, got off the plane, there I am in the buckskin leather jacket, all my rings on, a, a brown cowboy hat instead of this black one. And um, uh, I go right into the office, uh, the, the production office. And I said, I got, hey, I got something I got to show you. I don't want to be arrogant, but this song needs to be the song he opens with. And I played him one of the songs. And the, the director and the producer listened to it and says, Oh my God, who owns that song? I said, I own it. He goes, but no, no, who's the publisher? Who wrote it? Yeah. <laughs> and they go, wait, wait, you wrote this song? Yeah. And you, you've got a publishing company? Yeah. Rock and TP Records. And, you know, they, they instantly wanted it. So here mm -hmm. I am. My introduction to my character is me playing one of my own original songs. Nice. That's Do you have really your guitar? Cool. Could, you, uh, could you give us a, a riff? Do you have your guitar? Yeah, <laughs> we would love it if you'd be, cool. be easily accessible. And feel free to plug uh, your when iTunes it, again. It's, it's yeah. Tom, what's the band called? It's a Tom Proctor band, named after a very famous guy named Tom Proctor. <laughs> uh, oh yeah, is he somebody we know, or we'll have, we'll have to get him on the pod. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's really funny because that the. the the whole movie career, a music career, it was, you know, a deal where I literally won a guitar in an arm wrestle. Uh, <laughs> really? As what happened. And then, um, I, you know, the game plan was just to simply sell it. And uh, instead of selling it, I started playing it. And I found, oh my gosh, you know, this just like calms me down a lot. Mm. You know, I mean, even in LA, I find if I play my music, I don't yank as many people out of their cars and shit, <laughs> you know, which might not be a big deal where you guys are at, but. Yeah. By the way, are you in LA right now or where are you? Yeah, I'm in LA okay. right okay. now. I'm going to head back to Utah here in a little bit, but I just want to. Let me just make sure this thing's been yeah, traveling. We'd love, we'd love sure. to hear the song from that movie. That'd be cool. Yeah. When is that movie set to release or has it already? Uh, it is. That one is released. Okay. And it's, it's really funny because, you know, as actors, we sometimes don't realize work begets work. So we, we were uh, doing the, I, I, I was, had was doing the movie another producer called that producer this other person producer had worked with me before but you know they had uh he had what he felt was going to be a rough day on set the first day and it was because they had a hundred and some odd extras and uh the music you know and trying to wrangle that and all that stuff and um and so I'm double splitting my phone. No, take yeah. your time. Take your time. Um, but anyway, they, you know, so she called to say, hey, how's your first day going? And he goes, oh, my gosh, it went fantastic. You know, and he says, mostly thanks to Tom Proctor because we had all these extras and we thought we're going to be chasing down extras every time we have to move the camera. And he said, but. And, and there was, they had a blue grass band with me and um, on it. So every time the blue grass band, every, every time the cameras were moving and, and people were standing around bored, I'd turn around to the band and go, one of these, one of these, and one of those. And then it goes to this. Okay. And boom, we'd go right into another song and just play another song. Yeah. I love it. 
And um, and should be, so, should be a requirement on every set. Should be required. And, well, just like entertain him. He says, "Yeah, Tom Parker came in there, and he just entertained everybody playing music." And she goes, "Wait, wait, Tom Tom Proctor plays country music." And he's, "Yeah, yeah." He goes, Tom Proctor, the the racist white guy, Tom Proctor. <laughs> and and uh, now this is from a producer who loves me dearly and knows that I'm not yeah. actual. What happened? Did we get cut off? No, we, no, see you. Still, we still see you. We're still on there. This is um, for some reason, mine just says Zoom. Can no. you see us, sir? <clears throat> yeah, what? Can you we see still, us? We, we still see you. Yeah. I think you just lost the window. Everything looks normal to us. Oh, really? By the way, this is how Tom gets out of interviews. <laughs> how, do, how do I? Okay, so how do I get the window to come back on? Uh, do you have a Mac? It's hard to know what you're seeing. Yeah, I got a Mac and it's all it says is Zoom. I would press the one, two, three, four, fourth button from the top. It's a bunch of squares that'll show you every single window open on your keyboard. On your keyboard, fourth from the top. From the left, yeah. On the left, from the left. Bunch of squares on that button. F4? Oh, command, you mean? No. It's actually F3, actually. No, at the top. At the oh, F3, yeah, you're right. Austin was just trying to like let you like look at all your open windows, but um... it's possible that the little the little zoom icon, it's like a blue icon with a camera at the very bottom where all your icons are. If you click on that, it should pull it back up at the very at the very bottom. Okay, now for some reason I got you underneath that. Let me see if this, let's see, see, I can see us as a group. Okay. Perfect. That's perfect. Cool. Oh, but I can't see like usually like it had me. Uh, well, at the, uh, in your zoom box at the top, right. You can switch from speaker view to gallery view. Um, and if that's possibly what you're talking about, top right of your zoom meeting box you can switch from gallery. To okay, so I got zoom meeting. Oh, well, that's on the top left. We mean the top right of the window. Top right of the window. Yeah, there's so, an option that says speaker view and there's a little square next to it. Yeah, right next to like, I don't know if you can see time like it. You know what? How about I do this? I just go out of here and call you back. That's okay. Yeah, yeah sure. That's perfect. That'll, that'll, that'll take me back to the beginning. Perfect. Do it. Cool. Okay. So we'll so. just talk amongst ourselves. I'm going to mute you until you come back on. Um, so you're muted right now, Tom, and um, come back on. Okay, perfect. Hey, it's, I feel like we're doing like the Howard Stern show right now, getting uh, you know this guy to play his music. Technical difficulties, dude. Yeah. Should, should we just edit this all into the thing? Yeah, yeah. I think uh, the audience wouldn't feels, mind feels going on this journey. Mark Marin of us for exactly. sure, and people like seeing who Tom is. You know, you don't really get a sense of somebody till you see how dude. they handle. I'm admitting. Yeah, man. I like it. I like it. Let's hope he. Let's hope he jumps back in. There we go. Hey. Now I get it back again. We're good. We're good. Perfect. So cool. set up set up the song you're gonna play and like what the song means to you and what it's called. Yeah. Okay. This this first one is called Country Man. And mm -hmm. and that's it, it's just basically my first album was was uh in time was uh dedic is is uh, Tom Proctor the Working Man and the, the song The Working Man. And the album was in dedicated to the working men and women of America. And I come from working class people. So, you know, just that's just the way that the way it works, you know, that's, that's who I am and, and kind of, but anyway, this is the one that worked for that thick thing. Some say I'm a rebel, and I was born without a cause. Me, I think I had one once, but you've forgotten what it was. Sitting on the roadside, watching the sun as the sun sets. Ain't afraid of love and night, just haven't fell in yet. Yeah. I was born a country man. I can make a living off of this land. And I 
was born a country man, yeah, yeah. I can make a living with my hands. They have tried to tell me that the country's gone to hell. I've been to Wall Street and perhaps it's just as well. There's just one thing that I don't think they can understand. You can take away my guns when you pry them from my hands. Tell me, I was born to country make I can make a living up with this land. And I was on the country making I can make a living with my hands From the cattle fields To the oil fields The moisture goes to those coal mine digs I was born the country making I can make a living off of this land And I was born a country man I can make a living off of my hand You might see the time that I settle down It'll be a sweet young thing from a little one or town. There's just one thing that you can know about my wife. She'll teach my song how to use his pocket knife. And say, I was on a country man. I can make a living off of this land. And I was born to country making. I can make a living with a guitar in my hand. Ooh, nice, awesome. man. Awesome. That was really good. I love that was it, really dude. good. I can see that killing in basically at least 40 out of 50 states, man. That's really <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, that's great. And they, you know, now, now, as you can see, I'm not bluegrass, I'm country. But they had these guys uh, there that had been a bluegrass band. They played all over. They played the Grand Old Opera. They played together for 30 years. And when you, when you see that song on Blue Ridge, you go, wait, he's, he's bluegrass. Because the, they had the, their, the way they picked it and everything like that. So this other producer says, wait a minute, Tom, Tom Proctor does uh, country music. And... He, you know, she verified, you know, that's the same with Tom Proctor. She, wow, I didn't know. So she calls me and says, I didn't know you did country music. I just listened to your album on Spotify. And she goes, we would like to use one of your songs for this other movie called The Wrong Way. And I said, sure, what, what song? And she says, God save me. And she says, because it's got to go to a beat of a line dance. And then she sent me the, the, the script and the thing that the line dance, the, the scene that the line dance was in. And I just thought, huh. You know, nobody wants to say their music is wrong for something. And it was right for the tempo, it was right for the beat, but it, it didn't match the theme of the movie. So you didn't feel like it fit the project? Yeah, I just, you know, I, so I told her like this. I says, you are more than welcome to that song. That's a great project. Or give me four days and I'll have you another one that suits that film better. Nice. And they did. And when they heard the other one, they just went, oh my God. Even better. It, it was even better. It's, yeah. uh, you know, at any, cause it's a line dance type song and it's, it was more, you know, God Save Me is a drinking, driving uh, song. And uh, this was more upbeat and fit in with what was going on, the young guys trying to impress the women and 
and everything like that. So mm. when you're, when you're doing a movie, um, like Ballad of Buster Scruggs, like to me, you're, is that the name? Yeah, that is. Shrugs? Scruggs. Yeah, Scruggs. I love, I love Scruggs. Scruggs. Yeah. Yeah. Like Aaron and I loved it. I'm sure Johnny did too. Yeah, but it was a fantastic movie. Like, do you ever, it seems like your music would fit so well when you're doing something like that. Do you ever say to the Coen brothers, hey, do you make it known that you sing too or are you just there to do the work? At that time, I didn't uh, make it that known because I, Jesus Christ, you're talking about the Coen brothers. <laughs> and, I, and I don't think, uh, here, here's, here's the other thing. I don't think that my, that I'm great. And, and um, we all question ourselves, but you got a guy who don't even know what chords he's playing. Mm. You, know, you, you don't? Sounded really well to me. I, I have no idea. I, you know, um, the only reason the music even came about at all, I, I started playing and I, you know, you know, I start putting my fingers down, you know, and the, what, and the first thing I did, I, I kept going and things would come out sour, like, you know, and then the back chord's the first one I found. I go, oh, that's a, that's a good, that, that sounds good. Oh, that sounds good. And I made a whole song that was just that chord and this other chord that everybody told me now is not a chord. <laughs> and then, and then I, and fooled then I me. some other things with it. Yeah, fooled so me though. I was, I was, it, I, I did a recurring role in the television series Nashville and I was, and, and they, they recorded literally in Reba's studio. And I, when I was there, I, um, I, Everybody went to lunch, and there was a, a Alvarez Yarley guitar that was so beautiful. And I picked it up and started playing it. And a lady heard what I was playing. She says, "What? Who, who song is that?" And I says, "Mine." She goes, "Who wrote it?" I said, "I wrote it." She goes, "That's yours, your original song." And I says, "Yeah." She goes, "How many songs you got like that?" And I said, "And at that time, I had like ten. And I said about ten of them. And she and she says, "Well." I, are they registered with BMI? You got them registered with BMI? I said, I don't know what BMI is. Yeah. She goes, you don't know what BMI is. I said, I know what a BM is, but I didn't know you <laughs> talk about that. And, uh, and then, you know, one thing led to another. She hooked me up with Michael Whitney and uh, different people, and they showed me how to register them and copyright them and do all the right things with them. And what does BMI stand for? Something. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you co copyright? I don't know. Yeah. That music? I don't know. Something. I don't yeah. know. It's like a copyright kind of thing. It's BMI yeah. and ASCAP is who. Right, you know, ASCAP. Yeah. Your, uh, royalties and stuff. And you have to copyright them and all that stuff. Well, the next thing I know, I'm in Nashville at Dark Horse Studio recording with Tim McGraw's old band, the Dance Hall Doctors, that mm. she had just got rid of. And and uh, you know, went down there and recorded an album. Then I thought, okay, now what? I got an album. What do I do with that? Yeah. And Tour. I so I decided to enter the album in K Dub Country Music Awards. And everybody says, "Are you fucking crazy? You're is that is that like a big award thing? Yeah, for country music. One of the okay. bigger, K Dub is one of the bigger country music awards. It's not as big as the CMA, but everything like that. But they're next in line." type deal but you're you win by the popularity of your songs and i entered an album that hadn't been that just wasn't even on spotified yeah nobody yeah. nobody really knew it yeah nobody knew it i had we hadn't done any concerts or anything like that and um and then uh we we finished in the top five in five categories and one songwriter of the year song of the year and best radio play and i said how do we win best radio play we haven't been on a radio and then uh I, and how, I, and how, why is that how is that huh? possible how is that possible because it's votes of the fan base oh, okay uh, that's awesome <laughs> and um and um and then I found out a lot of what was happening there was a lot of my acting fans were going oh. on 
They kind of followed followed you over, yeah. Followed me over and was voting on it. And and I found out many of those because um James Logan, the guy that wrote the movie that I would that I did, um and I was so thrilled when I read his script and found it was just marvelous. Um but James calls me up out of nowhere. He goes, What the fuck, dude? He says, I bought your album, it's really good. <laughs> Was he, was he was surprised? He was like, I got Yeah, and I said, well, why would you buy it if you didn't think it was really good? He said, I was just trying to support, brother. <laughs> <laughs> nice of him. So without, without trying to backtrack too far, I know you talked about working with the Coen brothers, and obviously that is a big deal, right? I mean, it's a huge deal. Two, two of the biggest directors ever. Um, what was it like working on a project with them and working with them specifically? Both projects... Uh, that I worked on with them. One was a Super Bowl commercial for Mercedes Band, a biker Super Bowl commercial. Oh, nice. And uh, the other one was the Ballad Buster Scruggs. They are a very cohesive. There's two directors, yet they're so cohesive. Mm. And they're open to you doing your thing. You know, you, you know, you got you got something you want to add. That's and that's great. And they had a very specific style that they wanted to use. And the, and the unique the neat thing about Cohen Brothers is they don't forget people. You know, there's. Uh, did they remember you from the commercial? And then when you did ballad? Yeah, yeah. As a matter of fact, the cat, the local casting director in. Uh, um, New Mexico, I had sent in an, I tried to get an audition on it and she wouldn't give me an audition on Ballad of Buster Scruggs. Hmm. Which is weird because I feel like you would fit perfectly yeah. in that world, and, right? And, and yeah, it, it, you know, the casting is, is weird. Um, and and so I, I wound up thinking, shit, you know, I might have to go around this woman and, uh, you know, I called my manager and said, you know, there's just something not right here. And then she called her. I got an audition. I taped the audition. I sent in the audition. Nothing. And, you know, and I, I don't mean to be egotistical, but I pretty much always either get the call back or... You know, I'm in the running. It's not a nothing. Yeah. You have a resume. You've done a lot. People know your work. Yeah, right. yeah. yeah. And, and, but a lot of things with my character types, they don't go by the resume because because when you got a when you're so specific to what you want charactery, his resume doesn't matter. What matters is what can, what is his performance. What can he perform today? Hmm. Um, I just did an audition for a recurring role and we did, uh, they sent me one page of it and then, and, and the, here's what happens to me a lot. I get where the character description is 25 to 30 over six, one over, over six, four big, huge guys, young. And my manager will pitch me in a mini way. Hmm. And I all, almost always get them. So I did that on this particular role, and then um, they they call, you know basically said, "Will you do another audition?" And we need to have it today. And I said, "Sure." Get to the thing. Nine pages of dialogue. Damn. Which really works for me because I'm good at at memorizing and and getting off and off a book and and owning the character which was what they wanted to see they wanted mm -hmm. to see if the guy could because uh, he has a little bit of a range he has uh, a thing where he kind of you know backing down and trying to appear to be humble and um they wanted to see that all in one thing and they wanted to give you a short time frame. That's to see if they can make changes on set. Mm. So, um, what do you, so what do you think you uh, like bring to the table that makes you so bankable? Is there something that you figured out early on in life that you just like the way to just nail these auditions and keep getting work? What do you think is different about you? I do the same thing that anybody can do. Anyone can do it if they just figure this out. 
if they figure out this one thing, and I can't tell you because then all my competition will hear this. <laughs> and, and uh, no, uh, <laughs> what it is seriously is it's this plain and this simple in the acting industry. Nobody can be you better than you. Nobody can do that better than you. So if you just take you and simply change your circumstances, the key to being a good actor is simply don't act. I have this guy, Eric. Uh, oh, oops, I shouldn't have said his name. George, John, <laughs> Jimmy. Uh, anyway, we will show up to these auditions where it's the role of the killer, the role of the bad guy, you know, swamp thing, uh, it's queen of the south. And then when I walk into the audition, he looks over and goes just like this. <sighs> The guy shoots himself in the foot automatically because he thinks, oh shit, I'm not going to get it. Tom Proctor's here. Well, that's not true. It's if the role belongs to Tom Proctor long before the audition got there, you're not going to get it. And a lot, so much of the time, the casting don't really know exactly what they're looking for, but they want you. They right. want you off of your picture, off of something. They called you in or had you taped to take their valuable time. And all you were in that picture is you. So you're already got the part. If you can just take, be you and, and change it. I told Derek one time, he says, he, goes, he says, Tom, he says, God damn it. He says, now, I know you coach a lot of actors. And, and at the time I was teaching at Central Studios in LA, uh, teaching acting classes. And then I coach online and stuff like that. But he says, uh, what is it? Tell me what the deal is. I mean, he says, we go in for a killer and you get it. He goes, I, you know, I, I don't understand. He says, I'm bigger than you. I look more badass than you. You know, he says, you're old and kind of fat. And I, so I looked at him, I said, Eric, how many people have you killed? And he said, you mean in, in movies? And I said, no. In real life, how many people have you killed? He goes, well, none. No, no. <clears throat> I guess they're still mine. He goes, so you're saying I should go kill somebody? I said, I don't recommend it. Well, what do you mean? How many people have you killed? God, you want to count? Oh. <laughs> Is this in the military or? Well, there's military too, but, um, you know, and then there's shit we don't carry on about, but, you know, it's just like when, when I go to do a cowboy. Nobody's good. You know, it, it, a, a guy says to me, he says, one one example, one movie set, they, the director said, I really want that white horse doing, running through here on this. I'd like to have that white horse. And the ringer said, well, you can't have the white horse. It ain't broke. And I says, how much how much time we got before the shot? He says, broke this, it in. Shot's up, this shot's up in 30 minutes. I said, give me 30 minutes with that 20 with that horse and he'll be broke. I'll ride him to the scene. Mm. Dangerous. And basically, it's, basically it's, what you're saying is you just – you're being yourself, right? What yeah, you're doing, you're you, playing you what you know. John Bernacker is, you know, they, they, it was a young stunt guy and, uh, and good actor, tall, good looking guys, you know, hell three beers and I'm doing, uh, no, probably two. <laughs> two, 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 two I got to see this guy now. <laughs> uh, uh, well, he's dead now. He, oh, uh, well. Had to go really bad and didn't make it, but, um, they says, on a car hit, they says, how close can you get to the stunt man? I said, that's John Bernacker. I can get within three feet of him. The guy, kid was naturally born with, with air ratchets in his ankles. You know, he had spring air ram loads. Man, he could just be nowhere and gone out of sight. You know, I've never been that. And um, uh, another example, me and James Logan, there's another one. You can look him up. Uh, we'll go up for the same bad guy. Mm. 
James Logan is the bad guy that's going to sleaze his way in and take and kill you behind, stab you from behind. I'm the bad guy that's going to walk in and pull your throat out right from the front. And if James goes in and tries to play it like me, he's not going to get the role. And if I go in and try to be James, I'm not going to get the role. But if we both go in and try to be ourselves, Cassidy's going to sit there for a long time going, damn, do we want this just bold meathead or do we want this slimy little weasel mm. killer? What, what, what bad guy do we want? Yeah. What version do you want to see? What, yeah. what version you want to see? Yeah. And, and just for Aaron, when you gave that killing analogy, you're not saying you killed people. You're saying that's how present you were in the type of character you'd play, correct? Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Okay, <laughs> okay. Totally I'll, I'll go with that. Yeah, <laughs> All right, good. That's what I thought. So I'm actually, I'm actually very curious because um, I'm not familiar too much with your story necessarily, but how did you kind of fall into acting or how did you get into it? Were you, obviously, you have experience breaking in horses, doing all that kind of stuff. So you, even in the songs you were talking about. Um, so how did you, did you always know you wanted to be an actor? Did something happen that you saw that you were just like, oh, this is what I'll I really wanted to do? I'll tell you the thing that happened that I saw that made me want to be the actor was the same thing that made Quentin Tarantino want to direct movies. Working at a blockbuster? No. A movie called Billy Jack. Okay. Have I you seen I haven't, I haven't seen that movie, no. Okay, most of the most... Both millennials haven't. And, I'll, have to, I'll have to watch it now. And, and, and here's what happened. So I'm teaching acting. And every time I say, Billy Jack, you got to see this movie. It's a great movie. And, and, and I could tell my students were not going and watching this movie. And so finally I told them, we're not doing any more scenes. We're not doing shit. Next time your assignment is to go watch Billy Jack and there will be a report on it. So they came in and have to, they watch Billy Jack and, <laughs> and they're all going, I come in and they go, just looking at me like, what the fuck, you know? And I said, so did you watch Billy Jack? And I'm all excited and they go, um, yeah. Wasn't that a great movie? Did you just love that movie? And they went, and they kind of looked at each other like, is this a trick question? You know, what's, what's going on with this? I said, you didn't watch it, did you? No, 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 we watched it. And, and? Uh, they did some cool stuff. <laughs> Is it violent? That, that, that's all you got to say. Finally, one little tiny 110 pound girl had the nerve to say, I don't know why you had us watch that, but it was terribly written, terribly acted, horribly shot. Hmm. It was a horrible movie. Yeah. And What's the takeaway? I thought, I, I gotta go reevaluate this because that was the movie and it was because Bong, uh, Billy Jack is this cowboy that sticks up for the Native American Indians that are being bullied in this town and and he's a hop keto master and I, and he trained under Bong Su Hong and so did I. And it was just this old grindhouse martial arts movie. So I go and watch the movie. And I go, Oh my God, it's a fucking horrible movie. <laughs> it's, it's badly acted. It's badly written. And his girlfriend's goddamn Dudley. <laughs> you know, what the hell? <laughs> and so, so it's different things. But anyway, so from that, because when I saw that, you know, we're, we're in a town. I didn't have a television when I grew up. We had one, one drive-in theater in the city, if you can call it a city. We called it a city because it had a drive-in center in its own grocery store. Where did you grow up? Uh, I grew up in the Ochre Mountains, Utah, Lehigh, and that oh, area. Okay, okay. And there was a uh, this was a drive-in theater in Orem, which was the big uh, city. And so, you know, so I think the excitement was that 
I saw a guy doing a martial art that I did, and he trained under Bong Su Hung, and I trained under a guy who 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 trained under, guy who trained under Bong Su Hung. Well, if Tarantino liked it, it must be good, a good movie for that genre or something. It must have some yeah, good stuff. It, it, but I, I found out on, on Django Unchained that that was the same movie that made uh, Tarantino want to do movies. Mm. Uh, but anyway, I got told the same thing. Everybody else gets told, you know, you're not going to, you're not going to be able to do it, you know, all that stuff. And then literally rode on to accidentally rode on to the first movie set. We were uh, looking for cow calf strays and rolled on, rode on to the set of uh, trackers down. And this was in Utah. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, old, old, old movie. I think it was like the first movie Chris Christopherson did or something. Mm, okay. Old B movie. And, yeah. um, and that's what got it all. And from there you were just like hooked in a way or kind of just like, oh, I just really want to explore off, this. I made more money in one week than I was <laughs> all. And this was not a high paying, the high dollar movie, but I, yeah. I still made more money in one week than I would make all year punching cattle. That was the one thing. And then it was the high of, you know, doing it and, you know, I'd rode rodeo and everything like that. And shit, I was getting paid more to fall off of a horse than I ever made staying on one in a rodeo. And it was like, seriously? I get paid uh, to fall off? Okay, we can do that. And they feed you every day? I mean, what is this? And, and Oh, that's another thing. We, we was packing our lunch still for a long time because we yeah. thought that that was – a restaurant that was on set that you'd have to pay for. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. That's funny. That's uh, awesome finding out that they give it to you for free. Yeah. Oh yeah. They give it to you for free and it's included. Wow. And I, I did want to ask you about um, Django Unchained. IMDB says your character name was Candyland Cowboy. Is that accurate? That's what happens when you argue with Quentin Tarantino. Well, tell us about that. <laughs> oh, really? Because <laughs> Candyland, if, if I recall in the movie, is the name of the ranch where the John, Don Johnson's character, right? No, 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 no. That was, can, Candy is um, oh, that's right. Leonardo, Leonardo DiCaprio. DiCaprio is the main ranch. That's right. Yeah, yeah you know, it was, it was, okay, so here's the deal. I was back in, I was in Los Angeles when they were filming that, and... Quentin was telling them they need ugly cowboys. We need ugly cowboys. And kept getting after uh, Jeff Dashnoff. He says, don't you have any ugly cowboys? Why, why all these cowboys? Pretty boy, I need ugly cowboys. And, and of course, on Tarantino set, you can't have your cell phone. And, and uh, uh, Thurall, one of the other stunt guys, said, get me my cell phone, and I'll get you a picture of an ugly cowboy right now. And so they let him have his cell phone and he texts me. He says, Tom, take a selfie and send it to me right now. Didn't tell me why. Didn't say nothing. I text a uh, thing and, uh, you know, says, okay, here we go. Uh, and I said, what's this for? And then next thing I know, I get a text. Ah. Uh, there will car be there, go to the airport, your ticket's at the airport, blah, 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 blah. You're good, got to get to New Orleans. Wow. I didn't even know what I was getting on the plane for. Mm. Just that, you know, it's, it's, I knew it was a Tarantino movie, and that was pretty much all I needed to know. Yeah, yeah. And um, the Candyland Cowboy, they, they had me, if you, I don't know how much of that I should say, but if you see... Uh, they wanted to designate where I was at because I was in so many places. I mean, I kept going, how is this work? You just saw me get killed over here. And now I'm back here. And they, you know, they just kept saying, well, all the bad guys look alike. It'll work. It'll work. So really? and then he designated me as a Candyland cowboy. Did, did you have enough, uh, a big enough part to actually get to work with Quentin or, or be close to him and watch him work or? I was I was there because, okay. First off, that was a stunt gig, not an acting gig. I, I was there on the okay. horses. I was there in the thing with him and Bruce Stern. I was there. Um, uh, I, I was 
close proximity to him, but I wasn't working as an actor. I see. But it was kind of an actor thing because he would, Quentin would always say, where's my ugly cowboy? I need my ugly cowboy up front here. I need my ugly cowboy here. I need it, you know. Yeah. And uh, for in our in our final 10, 15 minutes, you worked on 12 Years a Slave too as Biddy, correct? That was your character's name? Yeah, Bidey is who was supposed to be a first mate. Bidey, Bidey. How, what was your experience getting cast for that and then working on a film that's sort of such has heavy topic matter, sort of like Django Unchained? And an Oscar winner. Uh, I, the thing is, getting cast on that was uh, a kind of original. Um, boy, I don't know how much to disclose here because there's so much that goes on that you don't necessarily want to say. But I had originally auditioned for the, the the captain and got beat out by a, just a bigger name. There Brad was Pitt. no, there, there was no, no, um, can't remember the guy's name, but he was on burn notice and all that. It was the captain. And the reason you don't remember him, uh, the director wanted wanted me on that film. Period. That's, that's Steve McQueen, right? Yes. And yeah. there was great, great director. There was, if there was no Bidey in the original script, he literally wrote me in uh, to as the captain's first mate to add to the, the you know, give a heavy add to the power of the captain. But there's was so much of my stuff cut out, mm. and you notice the entire captain is cut out. Interesting. And um, uh, I, I don't know the, what went into play there, but it was, it, it's just the way these things work a lot of times. You, yeah, you don't really know cut, what's Cut gonna... for time, probably. Well, it needed to be cut for time. The first one that I watched, the original premiere, was, oh my God. <laughs> you know, uh, no one was being rude, but man. There was, there, was, <laughs> there, was, there, was, there was a race to the restroom. <laughs> Is that, that was the director's cut, I'm guessing, right? Yeah, it, whatever. Well, four, it was. Hour, four hour cut. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. You know, well, he's a great director. I mean, I've seen some of his other work and he's, oh, he's amazing. fantastic films. Yeah. And he very definitely knows what he wants. Uh, Steve McQueen's an incredible director. I would kill to work with him again. Yeah. Uh, absolutely incredible. Well, it sounds like he was familiar with your with your work already ahead of time because he wanted no, you to film, he, right? That, that was an audition that okay. he, uh, God, he was not necessarily familiar with my work, but he liked the audition. Okay. As a matter of fact, I had a rough time getting the audition because the casting director looked at me as a stuntman hmm. and would not give me an audition for the longest time on a lot of things, on uh, Memphis Beat and several other things. And they, she looked at me as... This is just a stunt guy. This is another stunt guy. Yeah. You, you, the, one of the downfalls to doing stunts and acting is you can get pigeonholed into what people think. One or the other, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and you were, also, I was right. just going to say, you were done and you were done being a stunt guy. You had mentally made the, uh, had the thought that I want to act. Yeah. I, I, I realized that you know, until I cut that part of my life. See, see, coming up in the industry, I, I had eight kids, so I had to do pretty much whatever I could do to keep food on the table. Mm. So at one time I had a 10 ton grip truck, two five ton trucks and a four ton. I was doing gaffing, cat, uh, you know, uh, DP work and everything else. And oh, then, wow. but that got in the way of my acting big time because you can't make a commitment to DP a film and then take an acting gig. So I sold the trucks and just dove in full on to the acting thing because that's that's just really where my heart is at. And mm. um, and then just now during COVID, I've taken up the other side again. I I bought a uh, uh, Black Magic Pocket Cinema camera and some good sound stuff and i uh, just shot a feature film while i was off of covid a feature oh, nice. wow you yeah, did awesome. you direct it too or just were you dp on it i no i had it got a dp i direct i wrote it directed it and um was the lead in it 
and then hired local actors there in St. George and, and local crew. It was it, it possibly the hardest shoot I've ever done in my life. We, have, we had a three person crew. Wow. And, but we had some amazing locations and amazing uh, people. And uh, that, I don't know if you've shot on the Black Magic, but that thing, the, that 6 cake Black Magic does amazing stuff. Yeah, we actually just shot a short on that actually recently. And it, it's quality. We, yes, we, quality. Shot, we shot this uh, fire pit scene, and literally the fire pit was the only lighting. Yeah, and it still held up really nice. It held up real nice. Yeah. You know, I, I bought it and some really good uh, Rokion prime lenses and stuff like that. So that's really cool. That's really, well, I'd love to see. Uh, do you have any, are you planning on releasing it? What's the goal with this project? Right now, I'm editing it and um, uh, in between edits, I contemplate shooting myself. I don't know how anybody is an editor. Yeah, it's the worst pro part of the process, honestly. It is like- My least favorite. <laughs> you know, I'm enjoying doing it, but editors have, have a weird brain. You know, I'll be editing something and my phone rings and I, I looked down to see who it is and then thought, forgot what soundtrack I was putting with which, what, and next, well, uh, uh, next thing you know, I'm like ready to just shoot the damn thing. So, By the way, I just, I just want to say too, uh, obviously you worked on Guardians of the Galaxy, which is one of the biggest films ever probably. Um, there's a scene that I've seen this clip multiple times with you and uh, Michael Rooker. Mm -hmm. that I always think is so funny where there's a kind of a, you know, a goof on set where you walk off a set and he, you know, he keeps kind of going. Um, what was it like working on such a huge, you know, superhero flick? I mean, that process must've been kind of massive and also working with guys like him. I mean, those, those okay, guys have been around first forever. Off, it, it was guardians of the galaxy was the biggest indie film set I've ever seen. Mm. Really? Because I've been on big sets where the atmosphere was stiff. I've been on television series that I call hot sets where everything's, everybody's. Yeah. Rigid. You know, but James Gunn was just fun. Mm -hmm. And Michael Rooker was just, just fun, fun. Yeah to work with a matter of fact when uh, i when we did that scene where i walked worker off the stage he said why don't you come down this way and i want rooker i want you to stop him right there and i said and i said okay i said so you want me to stop right there and michael Rooker said, i'll stop you and i said you'll stop yeah you don't want me to stop for you <laughs> well no i'll stop you yeah i said, have you noticed that i'm not on the slim fast program <laughs> and he goes trust me i'll stop you and i said trust me you won't and off we went when we come through when I marched him off the scene. That's what was so funny about that one. Yeah. yeah. Oh, he didn't, you know, and, yeah. uh, but, but super good people, uh, just really good banter. I love that, you know, if they had first off, they'd had contacts for me, they'd had prosthetics and all of this. And it was during the rehearsal that James Gunn goes, no, I, I want his face just the way it is bring out his scars. I don't even want him to have the contacts. Mm. He's, you know, uh, that must feel great. You know, you know, as an actor who wants their face on camera and just be, to be able to act, it's a lot easier without that stuff. Well, and then, and then the difference in the recognition, you know, like the, the guy that was the blue man with me, even though he was in the scenes the same as I was, you know, he's not getting invited to the conventions and asked to sign autographs. Mm. You know, yeah. uh, because he's another blue guy, you mm -hmm. know, and, um, uh, you know, it, it's funny, those little, you know, tiny things, you know, it's just, it, it, it's an interesting world we live in. It's an interesting thing that we do, uh, making movies and everything. You all got to be batshit crazy to do it. <laughs> And, and, and that's part of why I love y'all, Yeah, you know, so. Well, I got, I got two final questions for you, if that's cool. Um, the first one is, uh, 
I, I'm always, I ask this question a lot because I'm curious and you have a big body of work from huge projects to indie projects. What are you most proud of? Most proud of? Maybe that one project that still makes you like, puts a smile on your face when you think about it. Um, boy, there's just so many that's a toss up. I loved the work in, in uh, Nashville because again, I wasn't a bad guy. I was the best sound engineer in Nashville and it's, uh, and he's, it's a re really uh, pivotal role. I love doing Justified. So here I am going hmm. to uh, uh, things. The, 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 the one that I had the most fun with and just enjoyed the most is a little indie film by Kevin Kangas, Bounty. And that was, here's one where you got a guy who just said, said, I'm going to write a role around you. Nice. I don't have a big budget. So we're going to, they're going to shoot it like a reality show, even though everybody was off book and memorized. It's a spoof on dog, the bounty hunter. Okay. And, and uh, we just shot nonstop flying <laughs> beginning to end, but because it's reality it's shot like cops. So bad lighting, bad sound is perfectly acceptable. Right. And uh, the things that did it, but God damn, it was fun. Yeah. That sounds like a lot of fun, actually. Probably loose, very like, you know, just getting to play. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And the last question I had for you is, uh, how can we get you in one of our films? Call me. All right. And you got to have a now, good script. That, Don't waste the time. That, that's <laughs> yeah. based on who you are. Yeah. If it's you, call me. Cool. Uh, you know, if it's somebody else, have a good script because yeah. I won't read it, but my manager will. And my manager will look at two things. He will look at the script and the team. She want to see, is, it, is the team capable? Look at a film. I did a film, a feature film called Looks That Kill. And uh, uh, look at the trailer on that and it, it was something I just had to do. The guy was a psychologist um, and uh, he's trying to tell this boy the the theory is this kid, anybody, this kid is so good looking from birth that anybody that looks at him dies. So he's <laughs> walking around with a mummy face wrapped up and my character convinces him that this is all in his head that he can come out and the world will accept him and everything, blah, blah, blah. And I, and I convince him to unwrap his face. And then, of course, I die. Oh, man. Wow. That's cool. <laughs> that, sounds kind of, that sounds kind of cool. Yeah. yeah it, it, you know, so it, it's something different. But you guys are creative as shit. You know, if you want to do something, let's get it on the fucking schedule. You know, we need to. Are you all are still in Arizona, right? No, we're in LA. LA. Yeah. LA, good, because my cameras hate Arizona. <laughs> it's fact, too, damn, not... too damn hot, man. Oh, shit. I had no clue. We were filming in yeah. San George. Yeah, Arizona's my hometown, so it's, it, yeah, I, it's, it's, I learned out there. really goddamn quick. Yeah. It's that. Brilliant. That's Ooh. why they don't make a lot. In the summertime, you can't, you can't do anything there. It's, it's just, it's 115, 120 degrees out. It's, it's yeah, possible. we were filming early in the morning, late at night, and then interiors. So that's yeah, it. that's it. Yeah, that makes sense. And well, that's awesome. I got to go back to Utah because I got some pickup shots to do. I'm uh, my dad just passed away, and I'm dealing with his affairs there. I'm um, really sorry to hear that. that. Really sorry to hear that. By the way, you were telling me that. That's okay. It was, uh, you know, I'll just, I'll just tell you, you're never ready for both your parents to go, no matter. Mm -hmm. how prepared you think you are you're not and um you know we all think dad's superman uh i i'm fortunate enough that he he went really quickly and basically painless mm -hmm. and, um but now there's you know his estate and stuff like that to right to handle yeah it um, was bizarre and i just want to say where can our audience find you? Is Spotify the best place that you want our audience to? Plug as much, yeah, tell us everything. Tell us everywhere we can find you. 
Okay. Tom Proctor Band on Facebook, Tom Proctor Band on Twitter, Tom Proctor Band on Instagram, Tom Proctor Films on Instagram. Uh, all, all good. And I'm on, Tom Proctor Band is on all media, Google Play, iTunes, uh, everything like that. And there is TomProctorBand.com. Hasn't been updated and the band members have changed a little um, since then. But... Um, yeah, just Tom Proctor Band anywhere, and and uh, Tom Proctor Films on Instagram and Twitter, and we're and there's a Tom Proctor Band Facebook page as well. That's awesome. I really, uh, really uh, sincerely appreciate your time, Tom, and uh, my thoughts and prayers are with you and your family. Yeah, thank um, you so much for coming on. Yeah, so thank really, thank you, so you for that, for the time. Appreciate that so much, Tom. Okay, now quit doing these jackass shows and let's make a movie. <laughs> I love it.